Roger Collier. I'm Dean of the College of Business and Technology. I'd like to welcome you all this morning. Sorry we're a little bit late getting started. There's a large group coming from Tulsa Public Schools, and they were held up a little bit. We thought we'd wait a couple minutes to see if they get here. They're not here yet, so when they get here, we'll just slip them in the back. Um, Hopefully not disturbing the speaker too much. Um, it's great having you here this morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'd like to make a few introductions before I get to our speaker today. And I believe he has a gift from some of the people, I, for some of the people I'm about to introduce. Uh, sponsors of this program, the Battenfield Carletti Distinguished Entrepreneur Lecture are here with us this morning. Dr. Harold Battenfield and his wife Mary on the front row. Next to them are Janice and Andrew Carletti, wife and son of the late uh, Dr. John Carletti, also sponsor of the program. <laughs> Unfortunately, President Turner couldn't be with us this morning. He's been running from meeting to meeting for days and days now, and, but he sent his better half in his place. Penny Turner is here as well. Better half, other half, what, whatever, whatever you think. Well, anyone who has traveled into or out of Tulsa International Airport is familiar with our speaker this morning, Mike Fine, uh, founder and CEO of Fine Airport Parking. How many of you park at, at Fines when you fly in and out of Tulsa? <laughs> of course you do. Of course you do. Mr. Fine is a, a 1970 graduate of NSU, a degree in uh, business administration. Um, let's see, uh, graduate of Leadership Oklahoma, Leadership Tulsa, one of Tulsa Business Journal's Men of Distinction in 2012. It's our pleasure, my pleasure, to introduce Mike Fine. Well, certainly an honor to be here and uh, I got two folks very important people in my life I want to introduce my mother right here I'd have her stand up I take too much time. <laughs> and my stepfather <laughs> I, I'm from I'm from Tulsa, but my whole family is from Salisaw. So we got a lot of history from all this area up here, Salisaw, Bayan, Tulsa, everything. So, uh, but there's obviously I wanted them to come and see me speak, but they played an integral part not only in bringing me up, but how I got started in business. And I think, you know, family can play a huge part in getting me started, not only in life and the steps along the way, but they played a huge part in my first business. So I basically had two businesses that have a bunch of stature in them. That a couple of small things I did, but my car rental business was the first business, and then the parking came after that. But to back up kind of a little bit more toward the beginning, um, grew up in Tulsa, attended Nathan Hale High School, and um, uh, Doug Paris was supposed to speak today, I guess you guys know that, and I just want to say, say a prayer for him. He has cancer. He's a good friend of mine. And I volunteer to speak in this place. But, um, and I think he spoke here about three or four years ago too, to the Greeks. Boy, super, super individual. But, um, Hale High School wasn't a good student. I mean, I say I'm a C, C minus student. On a good side, I mean, a good day. But, big day dreamer. I was telling my mom a little bit about this. Well, she knows about it because I wish she could actually make a couple of comments about my day dreaming days, which lasted forever. But all those years of sitting in class, bored to death, looking out, dreaming about flying airplanes, driving cars, you know, just boy stuff. But as I got older and got a little more seasoned and got some experience in business, I realized that visualization that I had really was an asset because I'm very good, and she is too, at visualizing where things can go to, you know, seeing businesses built or property developed, you know, whatever. That, that's really important in business. 
And uh, a lot of my influence came from my early years growing up, not only in Tulsa, but spending all my summers almost in Salisaw. And my grandfather was a huge entrepreneur. He had grocery stores, feed stores, motel, building safe. You know, he, he just was a pure entrepreneur, but huge on customer service. He was always giving more to people than they expected. And I think that was a great influence on me being around that type of family life and, and the way he served people in business. And then my father had a small business in Tulsa too. But growing up in the 50s and 60s and 70s, all of us guys worked in our cars for the most part, had a lot of experience with the mechanical side of life, our vehicles. And I didn't realize what a large part that would play because later on, I mean, everything I was interested in was airplanes and cars and sprinkling a girlfriend here and there, you know. But the cars and, and uh, airplanes were what a lot of us boys were motivated to spend time around. And I kind of parlayed that mechanical side into my very first car I bought and resold. My stepfather, Ronnie, uh, had a friend that had a little car wholesale business, and I bought, I think, a 57 Dodge for $75 and bought a can of green turtle wax, waxed it, cleaned it up, ran an ad on it, and sold it for 150. That was 100% profit. And man, I was motivated thinking this is a great way to make some money, you know, some extra money. So I kind of started doing that as a way to make some money on the side for, for years and learn a little bit about business, buying and selling. I never had any interest in being in the car business at all. But that was even before college, I started that. But then, of course, Northeastern, I was here from 66 through 70, had a lot of friends that came here, great things I'd heard about Northeastern. I actually spent one semester in Miami, a &M. If you didn't play football, though, up there, you would not know one. That was a football school. But I missed, I missed my friends, and so many of them were here, so I came down in the middle of the night, mid-semester, or at the end of the semester, drove my four-door 57 Chevy down here, moved into Haskell Hall. Spent four years there, two of those years as a dorm counselor, and loved North Northeastern. And learned so much about life and people and friendships. And I encourage you guys to, in school, stay in touch with your friends. We all know that as we get older. Don't take lightly these people you know, because you're all going to grow up and be someone somewhere in business. And you need those friendships, you need those contacts in business. So. And even some of your old high school friends, you know, keep keep up with those people. But that's priceless, those, those friendships. But I didn't know what I wanted to do in school. You know, I, had, I actually, I think I had a double major. I think you checked that myself. I think, it was, I think it was business and economics. But back at that time, too, Vietnam kept us all, kept us boys motivated to stay, to stay in school. But love Northeastern, fantastic school. You know, if I can turn time back, I'd be five more years, four years, whatever. I, I, it's the best time of your life. But after school, I tried to decide what I wanted to do. I, I was very motivated to learn my own business. A lot of my family did. I wanted to do something on my own. But I didn't want to be in the car business, even though I had this pretty good background for buying and selling and making money. I actually did that quite a bit after school. Went to work at Texas Harbor Finery for a, a couple of years, desk job in the accounting department. Bored, 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 bored. <laughs> but it helped show me, you know, what I don't want to do. To get a job at Texaco, I knew one of my former roommates from here who was an engineer. And he got me a job here. The only people they hired were friends and relatives. I was in the friend category. And you start out doing grunt work there. They, they would put you in these cat crackers and crawl in these big metal vessels and go in and clean stuff. Stuff I wouldn't be kidding how you crawl in it now because I think it was dangerous. You know, you can look back at it. But, you know, I worked in Winter Bread Bakery a couple of summers. And uh, they had you stacking pans when you start to work there. You had to wear these asbestos gloves and you stack the hot pans after they dump the bread out. And that's the first place they put you. You get through that. It was a union job that paid well for being in college. But if you pass that, you know, that test, they let you do some of the other line work, the easier stuff. But it was a great summer job. But uh, trying to decide what, what am I going to do with my life business-wise, 
not wanting to be in the car business, 60 minutes have a spot. This is where you always got to keep your eyes and ears open for ideas, you know, always looking. But 60 minutes did a spot on Rhetoric in California. And I thought, wow, that's, they're doing exactly what I'm doing. Not renting cars, but, you know, I'm buying the same kind of cars and reselling them. Why couldn't I turn that into a business here in Tulsa? So that's where my set bottle was touched in. But I uh, got the idea and didn't have the money. I've been buying and selling cars now for a few years, and I've really proven to the family that I knew what I was doing and I could make a little bit of money, and I was trustworthy, trustworthy with money. I go crazy. And uh, he was an electrician, his father was an electrician, his brother was an electrician. And again, friends and family, that's the only people they loan money to at the Electric Workers Credit Union. I was in that category. And he was able to get me a loan for $150,000. $75,000 bought a piece of property, which we'll have some pictures here in a second, they'll probably show that. I bought a piece of property for $75,000. It was an old Griff's Burger Bar. It was the second fast food hamburger joint in Tulsa. You could buy 10 hamburgers for a dollar from two weeks. <laughs> 10 hamburgers. And uh, we bought that property, or I bought that property. 75,000, I had 75,000 left, and I bought about 60 used cars with that. Didn't have any idea that I was going to a car, but I just felt like I could make this work. So if you don't know how to rent a car, how do you figure out how to rent a car? You know, I mean, you know people walk out and they rent them, but you have no clue how to do it. So I got to the airport and go to uh, the rent account, rent a car counters, and I talked to all the guys and girls that work there, telling them who I am and what I'm going to do. And a girl from Hertz volunteered to go to work for me. And I hired a guy from, girl from Hertz. She was my first employee. She came with her big worksheet from Hertz. And I thought, I've got experience now, and we know what to say and ask for when the person walks out. And that's how we started, this little girl from Hertz. And uh, we took cash deposits, which the rent car folks wouldn't do. They were credit cards, but that's much riskier than to take cash deposits. So it helped me learn a lot more about people. You had to read them, because my insurance is what we call secondary insurance, not primary. So I had to verify every person had primary insurance and a job and take the hundred dollars and then evaluate and listen to them when you talk to them and decide are they going to bring this car back or not. <laughs> and they didn't always bring it back. back. But it was, it was a great learning experience for me and I learned a lot about people here. <clears throat> but those years of making that payment every month on that property and all that learning experience with people, that obviously paid a big, I mean that was everything for me to get out to <coughs> But right after I opened up, I started getting a few calls from the airport. Guys were getting in the phone book and calling us and asking what was the price of our cars. Because a lot of people were savvy enough to know that you can rent a car cheaper off the airport than you can on the airport. And we, we rented cars. Yeah, here's a picture of it, right? That's the old Greg Smurfy bar there on the left. And that's the type of car. Those were 600 to 1200 maybe $1,500 cars at that time. And uh, we were able to rent those cars for, oh, usually a couple of years, get most of the life out of them, and then turn them and sell them for two or three hundred dollars, maybe four hundred, still get a little out of them. I even tried, I went down the street and opened another little place called Rent a Cheap Heap. These are already really cheap. <laughs> it was called Rent a Cheap Heap, and I'd rent cars for four ninety five a day and ten cents a mile. But I decided fine used car rental was all I needed to spend my time doing because rent a GP was a little, that was just a little too much. Just sell the car and move on. But before we opened it up, we called it fine used car rental. There, you know, we had a renter rep, you could buy the franchise. But I didn't like that negative name or the Bible Belt. I thought, why, there's enough negativism just renting a used car. Why call it a wreck? But my stepfather and I flew out to North Carolina and went to a place called uh, Rent. Lisa Lane, that's what it was. We went out there and looked at their franchise. It was a little more positive today, but I went out there to see what they had to say. And I realized after being there, they'd only been in business a few, few months. They knew less about cars than I did. And I knew I could rent a car, I felt. And uh, we decided not to go with them. And there's a real funny story, too. While we were there, we were talking about this on the way up here. We went out to dinner with these folks that night. 
Now this is a guy trying to sell a franchise to us, the owner of the company and his main sales team. And we went to this nice restaurant, sat down at the table. We had barely sat down. And this lady, <laughs> she puked through her hands <laughs> onto the table. I mean, we haven't even, we haven't even ordered. We're just saying, she just like, blah. I mean, you talk about gross. Oh my gosh. The owner could have crawled under the table. He thought, there's the end of that sale. You know, there's no chance we're going to sell these guys a franchise. So obviously, she took off. We got out. We had a different table. We finished dinner without her. But I felt so sorry for him and her because what a way to start a business did. But and that's not the reason we didn't buy from them, but we just felt like we still needed a better <laughs> Bomb at dinner is not a good way to start a, a relationship. But we came back and unbelievably I started my last hang on that picture for a second. I, we started my business with my name. I the best name of all. Fine fine used car rental. This gentleman here was uh, he went to Northeastern, he went to Rogers. And he loved Northeastern. But this is a, well, you can see our little sign there. That was our arrow sign. We take the Hertz away, $9 a day, 10 cents a month. But that's where I started to learn. I've just got this knack about advertising. Not that that's anything brilliant, but I just like that kind of goofy stuff, you know. Because I had a lot of fun with that. We had a lot of people laugh about it. And then my other crazy stuff is, that was a Pinto, a Ford Pinto, which is a joke now, I guess. <laughs> but we flipped that car over upside down. We moved it a little more toward the center there in the grass. And I, I have a picture somewhere of it with me. We put a little sign on it, and it says, you will flip over our prices. It had this little sign sticking in. And uh, the first night after we flipped it, and it was sitting there, I didn't have a sign on it. I got a call. I don't know how to got my number, but the police woman called me. It's the middle of the night. And said, you might want to come down here. There's been some vandalism at your lot. Someone's flipped one of your cars over. <laughs> I thought that was really sweet of her to call me, but I told her it was an advertising marketing thing we were doing. And she said, oh, really? Wow, okay. <laughs> but that was really, really fun. And uh, I learned a lot from that business. In fact, one time I had a couple of interesting renters. One time I had a couple of pretty big guys come in, look kind of rough, and they wanted to rent a van. And, I, and through the conversation, you find out why they want it. They were renting it for Andre the Giant. You guys know who that guy was? Andre the Giant was in town for some wrestling extravagance at the fairgrounds. He wouldn't fit in a car. They said, we can't get him that car. They needed a car with him. So I rented a van to them for Andre the Giant. I never saw him. They didn't bring him over. And then another time, a car pulls in, an interesting looking guy, white hair, and his Indian, I think, girlfriend at that time. It was Leon Russell. And I've got a picture of him somewhere, but he came in and rented a car, and I found out later he, he's very conservative with money. And he rented a car from us because we were cheaper. <laughs> and very nice guy, very nice guy. But um, kind of back to the long story. Is our time up yet? Still have a little time left? Okay. Um, how do you get from car rental to parking? And by these people calling us from the airport, we realized, gosh, we ought to have, have an airport location. So I started uh, going out to the airport looking at property around there for car rental. Didn't have a clue about parking. Well, somewhere along in that timeline, my Hertz girl left. This is when we finally signed the contract. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it took a while to get the contract signed for parking. But my Hertz girl left, and I hired a girl from Budget. And through her working for me, and I don't have a picture of her, through she and I driving out to the airport and driving around looking, we came up with the idea of parking because the airport didn't have the parking garage at that time. All they had was a surface lot, and they were running out of space all the time. And I thought, whoa, you're on the that's the only road that exited to the airport, that ramp. They hadn't even opened the road from the other side going downtown. So I thought, well, you've got the only exit going into the airport, a vacant piece of land. They're running out of room. 
You don't need to do any market surveys or studies for that. It was instant. <coughs> so uh, I started working on well, somewhere along there though, I had stopped and met the people that owned the building. And uh, I kind of stepped ahead there a little bit. First, I started trying to rent the corner of the lot from the building. Uh, that's on this property. This is the original building up here. We tried to rent a corner out there to park cars on just for rental. I, I didn't have the idea yet for parking. But after messing with that for, gosh, that was probably a year and a half or so, I started thinking, maybe I'm going to buy this property. And yet, we still were thinking car rental. But the girl working for me from budget, budget rent a car was down the street of Pine Memorial. And they had parking and rental. And through her and I talking all at about the same time, we go, whoa, what about parking? Oh my gosh. And I was making a living in car rental, but barely. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't much left at the end of the month. But it was still a great start. When we got the idea for parking, we were like, wow. So then I started talking to folks about buying the property, but never told them. And uh, that went on from the time I actually got the idea to actually purchase probably took about four years. And most of that was just because these people did not want to sell. They only wanted to rent. And during that time, the airport themselves, uh, I mean, I kept getting a no, no, no. This is a great example about persistence. You know, whatever, you've got to have passion for whatever you do. If you want to succeed, you've got to have passion. And I obviously had a passion for it. But I kept getting these notes. No, we don't want to sell it. Of course, I never mentioned parking to them ever. But about two and a half years into this, they told me the airport's going to buy the property. They're going to eminent domain it, put some underground storage tanks for airplanes for uh, fuel, and they're going to buy it. Well, I thought, gosh, it's over. You know, I just thought it's done. But I just kept calling them and checking. And after, I'd say about eight months or so went by, until they said, you know what? The airport's dragging their feet. We're going to give them six more months to get this bought. And if they don't, we'll talk to you. The airport dragged their feet, didn't buy it. And I got a yes. So after about four years of no's, I finally got a yes. And boy, it was all about persistence. Because, I mean, there's so many times with all those no's, I could have easily given up. But I believe so much in the idea that I thought, you know, I was very passionate and aggressive about, I don't want to be a poor person all my life. I mean, I don't want to just get by. And I knew that if I could make this leap, I could make everything else happen. I mean, I totally believed in that. So I thought, I just cannot, this is a critical point in my life, I could sense it. I could hesitate here a little bit and kind of go, oh gosh, you know, it's just, you know, it's just, I never get up. And as they know about me, that's part of my personality is you don't give up. Especially if you, when you feel like you're really right on something. You know? And obviously there's a lot of God behind this too. A lot of prayers, a lot of, there's a whole belief system there. But uh, I finally got to the yes. Well then when they said yes, you can buy it. And I think at that time, one not thing, I know it was. They wanted six hundred thousand. I was buying about three hundred, three and a half acres for six hundred thousand. The airport was only going to pay five hundred thousand, so they were already apart from them on the money. But if I wanted it, it was six hundred thousand. I didn't have six hundred thousand. I had this little car rental business that made very little money. And this shows how naive I was back then. I knew my bank knew how much I was worth, so I didn't go to my bank to try to borrow money. <laughs> I went to a couple friends, but long story short, on that they would own too much of it. And I really wasn't looking for a partner, I was looking for a loan. So, another friend of mine I knew from the ski club, he was the president of the bank, and I went to him thinking maybe he could loan the bank. He comes out, looks at it, likes it so much, he wants to be my partner too. And I thought, that's a great confirmation. Here's a seasoned veteran, super nice guy, wants to be my partner. But I don't want a partner. So, I kept looking, went to another couple of banks, you know, they weren't interested. The last place I went was my bank, but that's, they knew what I was worth. They loaned me the money. And a lot of that was because I've never missed a beat on a payment. Never a hiccup 
and all that. And, and because of that, with my stepfather, never the hiccup, saw me always do what I say I do. He got me the loan for 150000 Without that loan, this might never happen. Every day in your life, you're building your story. Good or bad. So think about everything you do with your family, your friends. Be honest. Do it with integrity. Because it will come back on you one way or the other. And if I hadn't kept the integrity, he would have never stuck his neck out, his dad, his brother, for me. And I would have never gotten that money. And even, even though my bank knew what I was worth, they knew I was very credible. And the property I was buying was real estate. And they valued that a lot. They knew they wouldn't lose anything being real estate. And we weren't spending that much money to make the improvements. But they loaned me the money. And that's how I got started. So I got to went through all those years of no's to finally get to a yes. And that is, that's always stuck with me. You know, if you really believe in something, you gotta have some common sense with it too. I don't mean you just can't just believe, believe, believe. You gotta have to use some common sense and wisdom with it. But that's how I was able to get started out there. But that little business that I thought, didn't think how important that would be to get that experience and credibility played a huge role in getting this piece of property. And then, of course, uh, we got open, and uh, I, I'm leaving so much out, I think. I'm not looking at these pictures. Um, I'll say this about this picture right here. We took the existing building. It had this little overhang, and that was where the car's exit. And you can see there's a height there of that overhang. The first vans we bought, see that van back behind there? The height of that van is taller than that overhang. And you already got what I'm getting ready to say. I think this happened a total of about five times. <laughs> but you can see that bar right there. You see that little bar we put up on the left? You're supposed to hit that first. But that didn't always work. And there was a time or two I think it actually was swung over when they came through there. And my office was right beside that wall. I can remember studying my office. Hearing this huge crash, I knew what that meant. That meant about $35,000 to $4,000 in money, plus a van out of service. And it's like, that's one of the stupidest things to do more than one time. Shouldn't have happened. You know, it shouldn't have happened once, but to do it again and again and again. I know we all have stories like that. Now, this corner where you see this uh, sign right here, Mike has already run that picture through, I think. Uh, right right here. <clears throat> the three and a half acres I bought did not include that acre and a third on the corner. And that's a very prime piece of property for visual. Plus, what you see right there is called a concrete batch plant. And when they make concrete, there's little flakes of concrete, what do you call it, flakes of concrete flying everywhere. So I was able to buy, well, let me back up. Before I bought the property, I, this is Michael Concrete in Tulsa, big old name, guy had some money, real well-known guy. I went to his business and talked to him about could I put a sign in that corner, it was real critical. This guy was about probably 83 or four years old, and you've all heard of the Wizard of Oz know about that. When I walk in, it was, listening to his voice, it was like I was talking to the Wizard of Oz. I mean, hey, what do you want? I mean, it's just like, you know, I, ooh, ooh, what did I do? When I told him who I was and what I'd done, bought this property next door, how did you buy that? I wanted to buy that. I, I've wanted that for years. What? <laughs> you know, I thought, boy, it's not looking good for the sign, you know. <laughs> so I was respectful. I was thinking you have to be. That's, that's who you are anyway. I really am. But um, he let me know, know in certain terms, and he said it. I was there first. And when you park cars over there, 
the flakes of concrete you get, live with it. Because I was there first. I said, yes, sir. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I bowed, but it was very respectful. Yes, sir. So we didn't park cars there for a long time until we really had to have it. But he was allowed me to put a sign there, which was really critical. But then he got to a point where we really needed that corner. And I wanted to talk to him about buying it. I think it was 200 not, I paid 600 you know, for the critical part. It's three and a half acres. I think I paid him 230000 for one and one third acres. But it was a critical piece of property that joined ours. And there's no other real, it was a very important piece of property. So I was able to purchase that. And uh, that was huge. You know, we have another sign there now. It's, it's an LED sign. I mean, it's just a critical piece of property. And we took the batch plant down, and they took it down. They, they used it somewhere else. But, uh, and then there's another piece of property. Well, this is one of them. I didn't own this. I did at this time, but this is south of our property. And this was just a, about 15 feet below grade. You can see all the dirt we brought in. And I bought that. I'm starting to think about where can I expand to because we didn't have much to start with three and a half acres. I went to the railroad and talked to them, or checked to find out who owned it, the railroad. And I was able to buy that, I think, for $60,000 in the beginning. But it needed a ton of work. We had to bring in all that dirt, and there's a sewer line running under there. And I think we ended up spending about $85,000 on this special type of sewer line. We had to bury so deep and uh, put that in. And of course, all the concrete, lights, and all that stuff. I had, I think, about $350,000 in that little lot. You know, back then, this is about 87, I think. And uh, on this railroad crossing right here, boy, you talk about something hard to get. To get a railroad crossing legally from the railroad, I say legally, that's the only way you get it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't cross the railroad unless it's a legal spot. It took about six months. In fact, Doug Pierce, who's supposed to speak here, his wife was the key person on that. She was an attorney. And she got that for us. But that's not an easy thing to do. And we still tiptoe lightly with that. We are very cognizant of having that crossing because that's the only way we can cross over that piece of property. But it's been a great asset for us to have that. And, and of course, we eventually outgrew everything and realized we needed to go out because we didn't have enough land to go out. And it took me a few years to actually get a, a bank that would take a chance on this, and it was Nation's Bank. You guys remember that name a little bit. And they loaned us the money to build that. That was about a $15 million. I owned about a million and a half on this when I started this. So I went from a million and a half dollar loan to 15. Hugely. I mean, when I started this, I never dreamed, you know, we'd get this big. But we did. And, uh, after this was built, we opened it in 2000, and we were open one year, 9 11 in, and it just, you know, just knocked the business down to, you know, a fraction of what it was. So it was tough to, uh, it was tough to make ends meet here for a while. And then Bank of America came in and bought Nation's Bank out, and they fired the president of the bank, who was my contact. Uh, they fired him, so I had no support. I didn't know anyone that had a bank for America. No support, and they tried to literally bankrupt us. They, they, they didn't want to kind of talk about 9 11. It took several more months to build it than it was supposed to. It had about a million and a half in cost overruns. You know, things that typically you, you see in construction projects. But if I would have had my normal banker, it would have been no problem. You know, certainly 9 11. That was nothing that we had anything to do with. <clears throat> but make a long story short of that, they tried to take us out, and we were introduced to this really strong Christian family in Tulsa, and the gentleman had quite a bit of money, and he had a lot of money in the bank, and making nothing but interest at that time, because it's still that way. <laughs> but he looked at it, and also thought it was wrong what the bank was doing. But it also was, he was a very good businessman. And he went to the bank and bought that note out. 
financed us for a couple of years. It was interest only, but the interest he was making compared to where he was, it was like, wow, you know. So it, it was a God thing to save us. He was blessed. And uh, after a couple of years, we had enough of a track record, you know, with our business side. We were able to get a, a, a traditional loan. And uh, but that was God gift. In fact, let me back up a little bit to when we first started this. I, I had a gentleman I hired to come and work for me. And he had some good business skills, but one of the main reasons I wanted him was because of his Christian strength. And I hired him. He stayed with me, I think, about two and a half years. But we started out hiring a lot of Christian people. Bring the Bible College, we hired. I, I bet since I've been open, we still do. I bet we've had a couple thousand people from Brandon Bible College. And uh, so we had a very strong Christian influence. God has blessed our business ever since the beginning. Of course, sent this Christian family to save us in a real time of need. So, you guys might know, but I had a brain tumor removed a year ago this month. And through that, of course, it brought me closer to God, too. But, so. I've always known it, but it came so clear how much, how much God played a part in all this. Because C minus two, I mean, I was not book smart. I had some common sense. But without, this is all his. It became very clear. I'm using his assets. And he's given me all his people. It's all due to him. And it became so clear to me through that. And even this first gentleman I hired, he didn't stay with us for more than two and a half years because he had some things he wanted to do in his life that he had a passion for. But that Christian influence, which I recognized I wanted, God gave us that, and it never went away. And we hire friends of friends, and still hire them right to school, but we have such a, you know, for those of you that have been with us, you know, I hear it all the time, what great people you have, what great training. I can't trace the credit for that training. I don't know how it happens, some way it happens, because I'm not an operations person, but it's God, and all came God. And Mike Henley here. <laughs> I don't know where to start or stop when I use this. Mike Henley's our operations manager. Or, yes, help me, Mike. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me go back to that because I'm getting ahead. Mike's come in. Mike's been with me about six years. It was not easy getting open. When we got open, this other friend of mine, I was telling you about this with me two and a half years. We went over to the airport, kind of like, I was so naive. I went over to the airport, talked to the, to the we went in and talked to the, we sat down in the office with the uh, uh, airport director. Told him who we were and what we were doing. He goes, yeah, we know who you are. It was kind of like sarcastic right off the bat. We know who you are, we know what you're doing. We wanted to know, is there any training, any uh, uh, licensing, blah, 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 anything like that. And all he did was tell us these four things they are going to do to Gonna possibly block off a memorial at some point because it's some way tied into the airport. That was one thing. They said we're looking to do your property in the next five years. Well, I knew that probably would have an empty threat because that's what they were talking about before a lot of we're going to be charging you a fee at some point. Uh, oh, many even mentioned you can donate your land to us and lease it, lease it back from us, and there's some tax benefits for you. He said, I know if that's circumstantial, that happens somewhere. I thought, Are you crazy? Yeah. Donate my land and then pay you rent. That's the way it started. So we walk out of there, there's no licensing, no training. So about a week after that, we weren't even open yet, I get a, a cease and desist letter from him, not from an attorney, from him. It's very short and sweet. Cease and desist all shuttle operations to the Tulsa International Airport you are not properly licensed to do business at the airport. There was no license, that's why we were there. 
and it wasn't from the attorney. But I mean, that's the way, and that was just the beginning. Oh my gosh, they ticketed our vans, they run us off from picking up people in the concourse, they passed an ordinance to make us pay a fee, and we, myself and Budget went together on that, because they had still had a parking lot down the street, and we won that in court. But I don't want to go all into it, there's, there's so many things I can tell you they've done, and, and they've manipulated prices ever since I opened up. That's a whole other story. But we've done, I wish I had all of them, but we've done a various amount of uh, billboards over the years. Oh, and that's another story too. When I bought the property, there was a couple of billboards on the land, and those leases were expiring. And when I found out what it cost to build a billboard at that time, it was about 23000 billboard, and they rented it for about 1200 per side. But you can pay for it a year or two easy. So I ended up just building the billboards, but I, I liked that so much. When I saw the money and the math involved in it, I thought, well, why can't I buy some parcels of land around town and maybe put up billboards and let the billboards pay for the land? Because I like the land. Land is an awesome way to build some future and some equity. And I did that. I actually ended up buying a total of about 110 acres, put up about 32 billboards to build a business for that. And then the boards that I did to rent to normal advertisers, I used them for us. So there was a great back doorway there to take care of those vacant spaces. Put us up, and then the rest of them made money. And I did that for about 15 years, and then Don Ray, it was actually Clear Channel at that time, they came in and purchased for four and a half million dollars. Those 32 billboards sold for four and a half million dollars. That, that was an incredible investment. But it shows you that all started from car rental. It started from working on cars. And if you think it, you always keep your eye out for one thing you may be looking at, but there may be a leg or something even better than what you're doing. Car rental, you know, working on cars, car rental. So we're renting cars. Then I realized I can rent cars at the airport, but I can park cars, renting car spaces. Much bigger business, much more opportunity. And then when I show up out there, there's billboards out, and I realize there's a billboard opportunity, I can rent billboards. So the three businesses I've really made money at are rental. And, and as you know, if you think about everything in life, you know, apartment rent, house rent, whatever. Rental is a big business in this world. You know, and I don't know what, who wants to be a business owner, but just think about ideas and and rental. It's, it's, it can be one of those things you can get into if you can find the right thing that is not that much of a reach. You know? Of course, owning real estate, there's any way you get in and make a payment on something while you're building your business. To me, that's almost double dipping. I'm not going to say never rip. You, know, you might have to do that sometimes, but if you can figure out a way like we did here to own your own property. Oh, backing up to the car rental business. When I, I left that little piece, when the bank loaned me the money, since I had such that perfect track record I talked about, I needed about $150,000 of my own money to make that work. Ironically, that's what I sold my car loan business for, was $150,000, and there was a couple older than me that was, he was work, she was working for me renting cars, he was renting my little three-bay garage over here. I worked on cars. He was doing it for some side work for Southwestern Bell. They had a track record there. They knew they liked the business. The bank loaned them 150000 That was my 150000 that I needed for the bank to get the loan at the airport. So they financed me to sell, which I needed to sell that business. So that just dovetailed right into stepping out of the car room, right, in, right into the parking lot. But, you know, putting in a service business like parking, anyone can put in an asphalt and ticket booth and say there's a parking business, but we're all about customer service. It's all about you. In fact, these roses that we brought right here, we, about 10 years ago, I did a little special thing where we started giving away roses to customers when we come back. Certainly to the ladies or for the man to take home to his wife, mother, daughter, whatever. And we've had so much fun. 
just like bringing them here today. I mean, in fact, our little slogan is, roses are red, violets are blue, parking and fine is always about you. That was a God given thing. <laughs> I was on my way to go meet a Christian life coach to go to so. And that came to me just as I was random stoplight almost in this place. I thought, wow, that was anyway, got on in clinics. Another little promotion. Oh yeah, yeah. Mike's got a little video here of uh, we talked about the the vans. Oh okay. We've got another promotion we've been doing, it's called Fine Dango, but it's we got a great marketing guy. And he's come up with uh, a little dance that we do. And uh, we made a little dance for it and when you come in a park. If you want to do a little dance for day, free parking, free t-shirt. <laughs> And you can get on right now on Facebook, find your parking and see if you can find and safety of our customers and their vehicles seriously. 
We have a casino style surveillance system, a well secured perimeter, and our facility is fully staffed 24 7. Finite Court Parking offers customers a wide array of amenities, including a Park Pass Ticketless Entry and Exit Program, Valley Parking, complimentary coffee, cappuccinos, sodas, and popcorn, as well as free USA Todays and Tulsa Worlds for all of our customers. We also have a convenient ATM machine for much needed cash withdrawals. Finite Court Parking also boasts a full service detail shop, and our highly trained technicians are certified professionals. They possess a great understanding of what it takes to maintain or transform the appearance of your vehicle. We use only the highest quality equipment, chemicals, and techniques to make certain your vehicle looks its best. Fine Parking has a fleet of 11 shuttles, many of which are powered by compressed natural gas. And typically, at least six of these shuttles are in constant operation. In order to enhance our customers' experience, all fine shuttles have been outfitted with plush, limo-style interiors that ensure a comfortable one-minute ride to and from Tulsa International Airport. From the beginning, Mike finds focus and dedication to customer service and enhancing our customers' traveling experience has been the foundation that Fine Airport Parking is built on. Our goal is to alleviate the stress that is commonly associated with air travel and ensure that our customers have a fine experience. We are Fine Airport Parking. My daughter's a dancer. She runs around the house all the time doing all this stuff. She's, she's 14. I think it's probably time for questions and answers, but you know, I, I forgot one little uh, there's a ton of stuff I forgot. But you know, renting cars, find someone that's ever rent cars, bring them in. Park cars, I didn't have any experience in that. And I went to Houston to buy some of my first group of vans, or used vans. I was at the place called Park and Farm. Bought these vans, a lady came up to me and said, I'm interested in moving out of town. She had some personal tragedy in her life for to move out of Houston. I hired her. She came up here, she was kind of like my Hertz lady. I had someone that had experience in car parking, and she worked for us for several years. Super nice lady, but that, that kind of gave me that same confidence that I had with the car parking folks. Just keep it, that'll, keep it simple, stupid, that's, you know, you can still make it as a C minus student. You know, you just gotta use your common sense. And don't, don't give up. But brainstorm with your friends, man, I, there's so many ways you can make a living to brainstorm. It's free. I love brainstorming. We do it for advertising, marketing ideas, customer service ideas. I mean, we could spend way more time talking about some of the details of what we've done, why we've done it, what's worked, what's not worked. I mean, I'd give it up talk if I had to, even though I don't like to talk to other people. You guys are really extra special. You guys have been easy. I almost feel like. Just me and Mom and your friends. <laughs> Mom, you got a lot of nice friends. <laughs> Question and answers? Can you open another expanding down to Oh, yeah, that, glad you said that. I thought that while ago, and I forgot to mention that. I've had that question asked for years, you know, what about another location? I, I've always looked, but it's not easy to find a good location. But long story short, I bought property in Denver. I bought the first 77 acres I bought nine years ago. I bought the second 77 right next to it about two years ago. We're just south of the airport. We're four miles from the terminal. The closest off airport lot now is off airport lot is eight miles. So we're half the distance. And there's another one going in a mile closer than we are. But this is a 1,280 acre development. It's going in, and we're down at the bottom of that development. So we bought more land than we need, but we've got opportunities now to sell land to make some money. So I bought this early, and that's another great thing about real estate. You kind of understand real estate, you get in early, because I, I knew before anyone else did, or most people knew, that this development was going in. So I was able to purchase property at a fraction. I mean, we bought property at the first piece, I bought 50 cents a foot. You know, now it's worth a minimum $4 a foot. And I bought the second piece, I got around a 
dollar that probably is, that we'll make money in real estate just for the buy. But the, but the parking lot, well, that's the cash cow. That's what allows us to do everything off the chart compared to Tulsa. In Tulsa, we've had to fight for everything. It's really tough there. Denver's off the charts bigger. In fact, they have about 60,000 spaces between the airport and the off airport lots. Tulsa, we probably have between us and the airport 6,000. And, they and they're growing about 4,000 spaces a year. That's how much more parking they have. So, not easy to find land now. I mean, it's already tightened up a lot. Prices have changed. But to answer your question, we are expanding into Denver. What's not to love about Denver? You know, you just get off the airplane there and you go, wow, this is beautiful. I'm not no Oklahoma anymore, you know. <laughs> Question? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was told this was a class that really wanted to get into parking business somewhere. <laughs> so where's all the questions? Yeah. Car detail aspect. I think that's a, that's a great idea. Is that your idea? Well, it was. But I'm glad you brought that up. It is, it is the, it's a great idea, it's a great compliment to be in the parking business, especially if you want a valet. Of course, you gotta leave your car at valet anyway to, to get a detail. But literally, to make a long story short now, I would not do detailing now that I know what I know if I didn't have to. But it's such a huge part of what we do. But I learned the hard way that if you don't have a great manager and the expertise, It'll cause you more headaches than you can ever dream of. Because people look at a car so different. When they come back from it, you know, flying, and they have a car to deal, they walk around it with a set of eyes that who knows when they really walked all the way around the car looking at it like that. <clears throat> so when I first opened, we had a detail shop. But back then we didn't have digital, all we had was film camera. We didn't take pictures. We didn't have any pictures. But we were always getting deemed by customers saying, well, that, that didn't live in. Well, we didn't have anybody proving it wasn't. I paid literally thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that we didn't do because I've had this philosophy from the beginning. Keep the customers happy. And it's a form of advertising. You know, the goodwill you build. So I felt like I was contributing to my advertising fund by keeping all these people happy, even though we knew we didn't do it. You know, because these are all used cars. They all have names in them. And I think ever so often we had someone new that would ding us, you know. But boy, when digital cameras came out, we got with it with that. So now when you park in valet, or in details, anywhere in the valet, we got pictures inside and out, pictures everywhere. And we're saving you from you, and us from you, and you from us. I mean, you know, Mike has to deal with that every day. It's just a part of the valet business. I don't care if you have a hotel or what. It is a huge bit of the business and of course detailing makes it even tougher. But back to the expertise. I've had various managers over the years in the business. I couldn't give it up. In fact I tried to close it a couple of times. I had so many complaints from customers wanting that business back. I had to open it back up. But finally I got tired of trying to hire locally there was no one had the expertise. And I knew enough about detailing. I knew there was no one that has the expertise. I've been to car wash conventions, knew there was other expertise out there. So I went to a company in California called White Book, which is a highly respected company, and they had trainers. You can send your people out there and train, or they'll send their trainers out and train with you. I sent two of my managers out there. They started training under a guy, and they said, this guy is awesome. We went out there really looking to hire someone. This guy is awesome. And uh, liked him, and I said, okay, let's, let's bring him back here to train our people. So we did, and he was awesome. I thought, this guy likes us and we like him. Could we hire him? I want that individual to stay at that right now. <laughs> That's Mike Henley. Awesome. Military family. His dad was head of the MIAs in the Pentagon, Washington, D.C. He retired, I think, a couple, three years ago. Mike is a former Marine. I know I'm not supposed to say what, what is it you say? You're always a Marine. Look at his hair. He'll probably tell you I need a haircut. My hair is too long. <laughs> so, so he came in, hit the ground running. He was awesome. He came in as our detail manager. But after a few years of being there, I, I felt I knew this early on, but I didn't have a chance to let my head of manager move on. That opportunity happened. 
Mike stepped in, best manager I've ever had. Family man, got two kids. Uh, just a wonderful individual. Makes my life totally easier. And it's helped make me look at Colorado. You know, if I, if I didn't have that kind of help, you know, in fact, he'll have a small ownership in Colorado because he's that quality of guy. We don't want this guy to ever go away. You know? and, and he has a passion for it too, though. Customer service, waiting on people, training. Oh my gosh, those, those guys really learn the skill set. When they learn detailing the way he, you know, when he worked at the other place, they taught all the Penske dealerships, Mercedes dealerships. He traveled all around the country. Did you go for Mercedes or did you? Yeah. But they've been, they've been all over the country training people everywhere. They've got expertise. And I mean, you'll hear from people who's probably just got a detail. I've never had a detail like that. And you won't. There's no one that I know of that has that kind of knowledge. So all we get now is happy things. You know, before we just couldn't get it as good as we needed to. In parking, I felt like I was a 10. You know, detailing was maybe a six. Now we're at 10 or 12 in detailing. We've had literally people come back and not recognize their car. That's how the transformation was, was so high. Yes, we have had a couple people not recognize their cars when they come out, but a couple out of the many hundreds that we take care of. But how we handle those, those bad issues is what um, separates us and um, defines us and, and keeps people coming back to us. So we keep trying and, 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 and focusing on moving forward and, and serving the, uh, the customer. But I can also say that in my short time here, Mr. Fine certainly is humble, and he will not speak too much to this point, but a couple of the characteristics that I've noticed that are just so powerful and overriding, especially for the entrepreneurial studies students, his, his persistence you know, he mentioned it, but not with the gusto and the and the oomph that it really needs. His persistence is almost unparalleled. I have been around very uh, a, a lot of people that uh, that have made an impact on me, but Mr. Fine is is in is in that very small percentage of people that that have made a major impact on me, and his persistence is unreal. The obstacles that he faced in just securing that land, he downplayed so immensely. Um, he is always thinking, his gears are always turning, he's always focused, he's always enthused. He's, he's thinking about, in, in here he's probably thought of two or three different business ideas, I mean it's unreal, you know. But his persistence is unreal. His ability to secure that land, his ability to make it through September 11th, make it through all the trials and tribulations that we won't get into with Tulsa International Airport, their desire and attempts and their objective to put him out of business, only lights a fire under as you know what, moving forward. Um, and that's one thing that he always does. He's always moving forward. And talking about brainstorming, his marketing ideas are crazy, off the wall, awesome. Some uh, uh, really work, I'm sure some maybe not so much over the years, not my time, but they're just, he's a joy to work for. He is a true uh, entrepreneur. He assembles people in, in teams and, and, and focuses on what he believes may be the, the skill set that he's lacking in. He hires someone he thinks is strong in that area and come on board and, and, and run with it. He, he downplays himself C plus two. Now, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I think we need to see uh, a report card. Come back. <laughs> he's sharp as a tack, but he eats, sleeps, and breathes this. He has a passion for it, and uh, I'm blessed to be here. Quickly moves away from him and to me. Did you notice that? Yeah. Quickly moves away. I could go on and on about him. He is an incredible individual. Not just because I'd say that about him if I, if I just knew him as a person who would look out. He's, he's incredible. He makes my life so much easier. It's a great combination. His respect for me and who I am. You know, that I don't sense any ego, any contest. We both respect what we, talents we both have. And we're able to pull that out complement each other. And that, that is something too that I think I did recognize early on is there's tons of things I'm not good at. Hire people for that. You know, because try to micromanage, especially when you don't know something, you just don't do that. So I don't think I'm even close to micromanager, but there's a gazillion details out there that are always so detail-oriented. You know, the average person probably doesn't realize how many little 
fine points we've fine tuned over the years. Even something as small as the scale we have there. You know, when you bring your luggage out, we have a scale, and we weigh your luggage for you before you get in the van, if you want it. But it happens a lot. And if, and if we weigh your luggage and you're over 50 pounds, we give you a free bag to put something extra in. Or, you know, if you have two bags, you're able to switch it around there, not when you're at the ticket counter and people are standing behind you. You know, that's the place to do it in our place. So it's the little things like that that make such a difference when you've got it. In fact, a new little thing we just started this week, this is really getting down to fine tuning, but all of us folks over 40 probably need reading glasses. And the other day, we took a trip up to Denver, I forgot the glasses. I couldn't read anything. I didn't have any glasses. But we had already, they weren't in yet, they're in now. We have bought about four different powers of glasses. They say fine on the side of them. Our drivers will have them, and they'll be asking when you're going to the airport, does everyone have their reading glasses? If you have forgotten your reading glasses, we're giving you a pair of fine reading glasses. And I tell you, that you talk about the right thing at the right point, that could be huge. Because I had to go in the airport and go find a place to buy a pair of glasses. But I didn't get to read the paper or read anything on the way up here. It's just a little things, you know, that we try to think of that, that can make a difference. He's got a few little giveaways here that he's going to give away. Mike, yes. I'm not a loyal employee, so nothing to gain from any commentary, but you and I have been in social settings at the university over the years, so we saw each other in the airport in the five area one day headed to New York. And just to validate what you said, we spent the majority of the trip talking over the seats on the airplane about marketing strategies and brainstorming. And to those that were with me and saw you, that was so impressive to them that you were so interested to know what people thought about your business. Um, that just that interaction with you and those other people that were around you made such a difference in where they chose to park the next time they came. I don't know what you said, it's made me think of something. It's a good example of making lemonade out of the lemon. And the airports cost me lemon after lemon. When I first opened up, we wanted to be on the airport call board. You know what I'm talking about? You know, hotels on there, restaurants, blah, blah. They wouldn't let us be on there. They would open me a letter back and said, you're in competition with us and you can't be on there. Well, legally, I bet they couldn't have done that, but I was still so green, I didn't have an attorney. You know, I didn't press them on it. But we could not... When we first opened, we didn't have a van there. We felt like enough. We tried to, but we thought, we'll just get on a call board. It's not very expensive. And Budget had a phone up there on the rent a car counter. You know, so if you wanted to need a van, you'd just use their phone. We thought, we'll just be on the call board, no problem. They wouldn't let us be on there. So we took my business card, my fine cardinal business card, and taped the dime to the business card. And every customer that came in, we gave them this card and told them the short story why we're giving them this car. Oh, really? The airport's doing that to you? Hmm, okay, you know. It's like, I think I like you guys already. You know, I don't like the government trying to stamp out, you know, free market capitalism. Well, we did this for, I forget how many months ago, but I started hearing back sometimes when people say, hey, I'm parking with you guys now, I'm sitting in the airplane. And I was sitting next to this guy, and he had this card with a dime tape it, and I said, what's that? He told me the story. I want to use you guys. I didn't like that story of what they're trying to do to you, and I didn't know you were there, but I like that story of what you're doing. I want to part with you guys. So we actually got business out of that. Now, we didn't do this very long until the price of a phone call went to a quarter. <laughs> I thought, wow, you know. But I mean, I've been doing that with the airport all these years. They throw us a lemon and we turn it back to lemon. We, I've heard privately from a few people say, you frustrate the airport so badly. <laughs> everything they do to you, you turn it into lemonade. But they just made me a stronger competitor because it's my nature to figure it out and do it better. But back to my original thought, it's always about you. And if you keep that focus always about you and keep it fair, we will win your business and your friends. You know, just don't ever change that philosophy. Where's that? Oh, we need to wind it down. I gotta go. Oh, I gotta go move some ballet cars. He said. <laughs> We'd have started earlier, but I was balleting some cars. Who wears reading glasses? 
brought a few of them out. <laughs> who owns a car? Who owns a car? I mean, who, who would uh, my reading glasses? What prescription we have to do? I, I've had some fun here with couples sometimes on these roses. If the woman comes through with the man, and for some reason she doesn't get a rose, and they've been parked in ballet, and I've walked out there with the rose and say, you know, the door's open, I walk up to her and say, this is your husband, right? Because this one time the lady was a little bit younger, and I thought, is this a daughter or a husband? I wasn't quite sure. So I said, this is your husband, right? I said, she said, yes. I said, oh, good. He wanted to make sure. He wanted to make sure that you got this rose before before you left. Oh my God! If you could have seen the look in both their faces, neither one of them knew what to say because she's thinking, "Did he really say that?" And he's thinking, "Boy, he's making me look good." I don't know who that guy is, but thank you. But he can't say anything. He's just enjoying the moment. Well, I have to admit, Steve never brought me a rose. And I heard it. Okay. And boy, I've heard that story quite a bit. Some of the women that come through and they find out we're giving away roses. Because I've had a few men say this. Well, I take her rose when she, she said, think I did something. We just have a lot of fun with it. It's all positive. For someone who doesn't like to talk in front of her, I think you did a terrific job. <laughs>